Okay, so if you've been using intermittent fasting for a little while, maybe the past three weeks or even like a year, and you maybe initially saw results, but now you've plateaued, or perhaps you've just not even experienced any weight loss with intermittent fasting, and that's your goal, it can be really frustrating. I totally understand that. So today I wanted to make sure that we can go over tips on how you can actually break through that plateau and actually start seeing the results that you're looking for. Because thankfully, there's a lot that can be done to help break through this plateau. Um, so let's dive straight into that for today. We're going to be talking about those intermittent fasting plateau breakers. So in case you are new here, my name's Autumn. I'm a certified clinical nutritionist with my master's nutrition, human performance, I'm the creator of the complete intermittent fasting bundle that has helped thousands of men and women around the world achieve their weight loss and wellness goals. In fact, we're actually in week four of the new year intermittent fasting challenge right now, which has been really fun. Um, can't believe that we're like actually toward the end of it though right now. But the first thing that we need to really understand when it comes to a plateau with intermittent fasting, and this might seem a little shocking to most people, first thing you need to know is that it's likely has nothing to do with your fast. So this can be, I'm going to make this a little bigger for you guys so we can really emphasize it. This can seem a little strange because we think that if you are going to have to break through a plateau, you need to fast longer. You need to um, get more, really double down on those perks of intermittent fasting by getting even longer of a fast. But this can actually be a problem for a lot of people and actually cause a weight loss plateau with intermittent fasting. Because ultimately, if you do have an issue with your fast, it's because you're fasting too long and you're doing that, uh, that long fast too consistently. So we talked about this in the previous live stream on how we need to balance out fasted versus fed. We need to both eat and we also need to have that fast to get both benefits of both of those. So if you are fasting too long and you're never able to get all of your nutrient needs in during that eating window each day, you fall into the same trap of just typical calorie restriction where you get the reduced uh, basal metabolic rate, your metabolism goes down. It makes it harder and harder to achieve a weight loss goal. So instead, we need to make sure that if you are experiencing a plateau, you know, first take a look at your fast and maybe understand that you might need to make your eating window a little bit bigger. In fact, I do have a quiz on my website that you guys can check out on how you can um, pick how long you should be fasting each day. But just know that if you have hit a weight loss plateau with intermittent fasting, it's likely not because you're fasting too short. It's likely, if anything, because you're fasting too long. Now, there are um, different types of mistakes as well with intermittent fasting that can definitely stall progress. We talked so much about those mistakes on this channel. So if you want to check out some of those other videos, I actually have one of my most popular intermittent fasting mistakes videos listed down description below for you guys. That would be a great place to start because what we're going to be going into today isn't about mistakes. It's about helping to build upon your success with intermittent fasting and breakthrough plateau. So you need to first make sure you're not making those mistakes. And then from there, you can add on these tips as well. So remember, it's probably not your fast, but if it is, then you're probably fasting too long. And from here, you just need to make sure you're not making the intermittent fasting mistakes that can cause you to plateau. But let's go into the first major tip here. And this seems oddly specific. I realize that, but this is also really important with the consistency. And I have a lot of clients um, that will talk about this on adding in. So first step, in case you're just listening to this and, and not watching, adding 3000 steps per day. Now, it's not that 3000 is necessarily a magic number, but it gets you out walking for about 15 to 20 minutes extra each day. And a lot of us are, even if we're working out, we're not actually getting moving throughout the day. So we might work out for about 30 minutes or 60 minutes in the morning, get that done, check it off, but we're not moving throughout the day as well. And we know that with intermittent fasting, one of the main reasons why you see so much success with intermittent fasting is because it helps to get the insulin level lower, helps to uh, allow the body to unlock, unlock, unlock um, the fat burning process and to use fat as fuel. So we want to help build upon that insulin sensitivity by adding in more frequent walking as well. So by walking, we're using our muscles, we're helping to absorb that excess glucose and help to bring that insulin um, level even lower. So it's something that we want to be actively adding in throughout the day and even just adding in 3000 steps consistently. That's the really big factor here it can help to build upon the success of what you're already getting with intermittent fasting. So even if you already are walking, let's say 10,000 steps per day, add in 3000 steps and just see where that takes your body. See if that's that extra bit of insulin sensitivity you needed to help break through that plateau. A really great story that I'll be sharing at the end of this live stream of one of the A and who had a massive breakthrough in her plateau. 
um, using almost exactly a strategy. So we'll get into that in a bit. But going into just the specifics on this, so I'm gonna make this bigger for you guys. So this really only equates to about 250 steps every hour. It, it doesn't even have to be a 15 or 20 minute walk that you're taking specifically, you know, throughout the middle of the day, if you don't have the time for that. But 250 steps every hour, something that you can just get up, stand up and walk around to your house, your office. It doesn't have to be something significant, but that consistency of getting the, the extra 250 steps an hour, which equates to about 3000 steps over the course of the day can really help to make your muscles more insulin sensitive and better at using fat as fuel and then breaking through that plateau. So you can see um, the first bullet point here talking about get your muscles moving. So you're actually flexing, you're, you're um, challenging your muscles even with a small amount of walking and that can help to improve insulin sensitivity and make it easier to burn fat as fuel. Now, something I really like, I put on here for the second bullet, um, if you have trouble remembering to get up throughout the day, I love using a Fitbit for that exact reason because it'll remind me every hour that if I haven't got my 250 steps that I need to stand up and you know walk around a little bit. I'll do like laps around my house or around my um, front yard to get my 250 steps in, but that helps to get the reminder in if you, if you have difficulties remembering to get up throughout the day. Um, and then an extra bonus here, if you can get up throughout the day every um, hour and get those 250 steps, which really only takes about one to two minutes to get in, and then add a lunchtime walk-in especially if you can get it in, you know, sometime around when you're eating. So if you do it before or after you're eating, that can also help to um, obviously improve digestion, but make it so that your body is more able to use any of that glucose that might've been in your lunch as well and not have the insulin spike be as high. So just a couple ways to double down on it from a walking perspective, but adding in 3000 total steps, just simply by getting 250 steps per hour, it can really help to make the body more insulin sensitive and bonus adding in that lunchtime walk as well, even if it's just 10 minutes. So really um, as much as we can get up walking, it's really hard to overdo walking. So just minimum, try and get that 250 steps in every hour. Okay, so the next, the next thing here, Second tip, so again, for anyone who's just tuning in, we're going over tips on how you can break through an intermittent fasting plateau. What I mentioned in the beginning, really important to make sure that you guys hear this, is that if you have, a, have hit a plateau with intermittent fasting, it likely isn't because your fast is too short. If anything, it might be because your fast is too long. So if you guys missed that, make sure that you start this live stream over, go to the beginning, so it's a huge important point. It's a very common mindset that I've seen with a lot of people on YouTube and the AN community with my clients. And it's something that can really be holding you back. So you want to make sure that you're not fasting too long, but you're getting that balance between fasted and fed. So the second tip here on how you can break through your intermittent fasting plateau is to remove all snacks. So this is one that can seem, again, a little odd when it comes to intermittent fasting, because it's like, well, I have my fasting period and then I have my eating period. So I should be able to just eat all the time during the eating window and that it shouldn't affect the um, the results of my fast. That's kind of true, but here's the thing. Every time that you are eating, it does cause your body to release a little bit of insulin, depending on what type of food you're eating um, and obviously how frequently, but every time you eat, that's when insulin is going to be released. So if you are not only having your, your meals throughout your eating window, but then you're also snacking, then you're going to be causing an insulin secretion every time you eat throughout that eating window. You never allow insulin to come back down in between your meals as well. But on top of that, if you look at the types of food that you're snacking on, snack foods are never usually going to be something that's rich in protein and fat. You know, there are some better options, but likely it's not going to be rich in protein and fat. It's probably going to be something like a granola bar or, um, you know, the like, different types of protein bars, which you know, can be high in protein, but we've talked extensively on why that's actually not helpful for your goals, but they're typically going to be very processed, high in sugar, something that's going to cause more of an insulin spike anyway, um, regardless of the fact that you're eating more frequently, eating during your, even during your eating window. So in fact, let me know in the chat, or if you're watching this after the live, what it is that you guys typically snack on. If you do snack, like maybe it's pretzels. That's a common one I've seen often or popcorn, like those little bags of skinny pop. I've, I've seen a lot of people have those. So let me know if you guys have those as well, but all of those are typically going to be either more refined or really rich in carbohydrates, because that's what snacky types of foods are. They're really rich in those, um, you know, fast digestible carbohydrates that cause that big insulin spike. So not only when you're snacking, is it going to be 
uh, more frequent um, secretions of insulin. So you don't ever get that dip down, but it's also likely going to be a food that is much higher in the, in the types of foods that spike insulin even further. Um, and on top of that, something important to note. So with the removal of snacks, it can really only be done if you're eating satiating meals. So eating the protein and eating the fat and eating the fiber that's needed to help stimulate the satiety hormones and make it so that you don't even crave those snacks. Because if you're not eating enough of, first of all, protein, which is our most important macronutrient when it comes to um, achieving a body recomposition goal, but also making sure that you're not hungry and causing peptide YY or satiety hormone to be released. If you're not eating enough protein at your meals, then you're going to want a snack because your body's looking for a fast source of energy in order to compensate for what it didn't get at its previous meal. And that fast source of energy is going to be sugar or starches. So in order to make sure that you're able to uh, not snack, you need to make sure that you're eating enough of protein, of fat, and of fiber. And that can help you to double down on those intermittent fasting perks because again, intermittent fasting, the one main reason why it's really helpful for um, achieving a weight loss goal is because it allows insulin to naturally dip down during the fast. And you can help to double down on that by allowing insulin to naturally dip down between your meals as well by removing those snacks. But it can only be done by making sure that you're eating satiating meals, which all you guys who are following the complete intermittent fasting bundle right now with the new year challenge, you're getting to eat meals like this that are very rich in protein, fat, and fiber. So if you have used the intermittent fasting bundle and you've calculated your protein needs and you're eating the foods that are suggested in there, that in itself should make it very simple to not snack. In fact, you guys can mention in the comments um, and let me know, but most people will tell me that if anything, they, they have to widen their eating window a little bit just to make sure that they can get all the meals in because it's so satiating. Um, so not snacking helps to double down on those perks of intermittent fasting, but you can only do that if you make sure you're eating enough of the right types of foods, specifically protein and fat, as well as fiber to help make sure you get that more immediate satiety. Okay, so before we move on to this next step, if you guys are loving these videos, make sure you give it a thumbs up because it really helps us to reach more of an audience, more people to actually get this information so that they aren't making the same mistakes that I know I made when I first started intermittent fasting. So if you give it a thumbs up, it really helps support the channel. Um, but let's go on to the third tip. And this is one I know we did talk about in the first live stream for this new year intermittent fasting challenge but it, this kind of a little twist on it. So we're talking about adding a structured workout routine. So in the first live stream, we talked about adding in resistance training, which that in itself is a really great tip because it is important to help challenge your muscles, just like what we talked about with the walking and resistance training is so great at challenging your muscles. But one thing that we didn't really talk about specifically is that you need to make sure it's structured. So a common mistake I'll see people do, let me make this a little bit smaller. Um, a common mistake that I'll see people do is that they'll do like total body workouts every single day. So if you love like a certain type of workout class and you go to it every day and it's always, to always total body, you're never actually, first of all, isolating any one type of body part to make sure that you're getting those bang for your buck, but you're also never fully getting recovery. So you're constantly breaking down your muscles, but you're not allowing the body to build it back up. And this doesn't allow for the body to get the actual benefits of the strength training or of the resistance training or of really any type of training that you're doing, because you need to not only have that built that breakdown during the workout, you need to have it building back up so that you have more muscle mass to make the body more insulin sensitive. And that insulin sensitivity is key for breaking through a plateau with intermittent fasting. So looking at the benefits of why this is so important, we talked a bit about this again in the previous live stream, I think like two or three weeks ago, but just for a re reiteration, because I know a lot of you guys need to hear this and maybe you just haven't added this in yet. Um, I know as Kristen's story is going to be a really great one we're going to talk about in a second. She had the same experience, but resistance training has a lot of perks and it doesn't have to be as scary as it sounds. You don't need to be Arnold in order to see the perks. You just need to be challenging your muscles a bit. But of course, it increases muscle mass and it doesn't necessarily need to increase muscle mass again, like Arnold. In fact, it's very, very hard to get to that point. Um, I personally really struggle with gaining muscle mass. So it is something that you have to work very hard on to get to that level of muscle. So if you aren't looking for that and if you're just looking to lose weight and achieve some body recomposition, there's still a huge place for resistance training for this exact reason. Um, but when you have more increased muscle mass, it also increases insulin sensitivity. So you have essentially more of a sponge 
for your body to absorb that excess glucose. So when you have more muscle mass and when you are um, challenging that muscle, it causes your muscle to essentially soak up the glucose from the blood supply. And that makes it so you don't need as much insulin, remember that storing hormone, to be pumped out. Because when our blood glucose is high, it needs to come back down some way. And you can go about that really one of two ways. You can either absorb it through the muscles or you can store it via insulin. And insulin is the one that will cause it to be more stored as, um, as fat. So in order to help break through that plateau, we really need to make sure we're increasing that insulin sensitivity through the muscles. Um, it can also help to improve carb sensitivity for this exact reason. So this is something I have with a lot of my clients where they've um, not been able to have very many starches for a long time because they were so carb sensitive. But as they not only achieved their weight loss goal, but then they started adding in more of these structured type of resistance training or structured type of workouts of any type. Like I mentioned, it could be Pilates or it could be whatever you like, as long as it's actually structured um, properly to make sure you're challenging your muscles. This can help to make it so your body can better handle these carbohydrates. So you can start to add back in some of those starches that perhaps you couldn't tolerate in the past. So adding in resistance training properly can really help to not only break through that plateau, but also make it easier for you to better handle carbohydrates in the future and make it so you can be more flexible with those carbohydrates as well. So I talked about this a little bit, but Kristen, um, I shared her story on my blog, but she also is going to be interviewed on the channel soon. So get excited for that because her story is really great. But here's just a little sneak peek. So Kristen is one of the AM peeps who had been using intermittent fasting from the complete intermittent fasting bundle for about a year. She had initially seen really great success, um, lost a significant amount of weight, but then she had plateaued and she wasn't quite getting the body recomp that she was looking for. So then um, after a lot of encouragement from the AN peeps in the private Facebook group, which is probably a lot of you guys in the chat right now who are familiar with Kristen and, and you probably were rooting her along this whole time, uh, but she decided to actually finally add in the workouts that are included in the complete intermittent fasting bundle. Start slowly, but you know, start to add those workouts in and after she had had a seven month plateau, she was able to break through that plateau, as you can see in this picture, but lose about 15 pounds plus achieve the body recomp she was looking for. So you can see this before and after as well. So adding in resistance training, even at the pace that you're comfortable at, you'll hear soon in Kristen's interview on my channel on how she didn't you know, start off lifting heavy weights or, or anything. In fact, she's not lifting significantly huge weights at all. She started off with body weight and is slowly going up pound by pound. Um, you can see that uh, it can have a quite a dramatic um, improvement on breaking through that weight loss plateau with intermittent fasting. And Kristen's is the exact example of how she had experienced such great results at first with intermittent fasting, but just needed that extra level of, of, um, of insulin sensitivity from the resistance trainings from a structured type of style. So looking at what you need to be doing it really can be anywhere between three to five times per week and it can be any type of workout schedule as long as it's going to be structured you're challenging a different body part every day so you're doing arms then legs then core um, or if you are doing total body that you have a rest day in between um, but you can use bands you can use dumbbells you could do pilates or the 21 day intermittent fasting program workouts which is what kristen was using you could do crossfit you could do youtube videos there's Pretty much anything at your disposal, you could do so many different things. You just need to make sure that it's structured. So if you need some type of structure to follow, there's apps. Like I mentioned, there's also the 21 day intermittent fasting program workouts that are broken up in, in a format to make sure that you're not overworking any one body part. But just make sure that you're using the workouts in a structured way. So you're actually seeing the benefits of what you're doing. Um, so here's just some pictures of the 21 day intermittent fasting program workouts that uh, Kristen and other AM peeps are using. There's also um, videos that go along it, with it as well. And then it's recently been fully updated, revised, really proud of it, really excited about it. This is what a lot of the, this is what we're using right now for the New Year Intermittent Fasting Challenge. Um, but yeah, if you guys want to check that out and if you want more of the step-by-step -step details, you can check out the link down description below. I also have the link for the free newsletter too that comes out each week. So if you guys want to get information just like this, make sure that you sign up for that completely free. And it's just once a week that I send out information on how you can help to further achieve your goals with intermittent fasting. Now, I know we went over a lot, <laughs> so I want to make sure I get through some questions. I, if you have questions, make sure you put um, four question marks before and after your question in the chat, and I'll go through them right now. I'm going to scroll up a little bit first. 
And if you guys, if you guys found a lot of value out of this, and if you like this type of topic, make sure you give this video a thumbs up. Again, it really, really helps to support the channel. Okay. Wow, we have Jay who's in New Zealand. Welcome. Oh, Kristen. Kristen's in the chat. Hey. <laughs> Super excited for you guys to see Kristen's interview. She was amazing. Okay. Sandra said, when I fasted, I became constipated and gained 20 pounds. Sandra, I highly recommend. First of all, it sounds like you might have been not having enough water and salt. That's huge for making sure that you're um, not going to get constipated. We oftentimes forget about the electrolyte component when it comes to fasting, but it is so important. It's really important, not just for making sure you don't get those headaches and low energy dips, but even to help prevent constipation. So water is often what people think about when they think about um, fasting, but they often forget about the electrolytes. So even just using something like Celtic sea salt, or you can use Element, which is another great electrolyte replacement, make sure you're using high quality electrolytes so that you can actually um, help to replace what was lost. In fact, that's one of the common mistakes that I see happen a lot with intermittent fasting. We talked in the beginning of this live stream on how what we're covering today is really to help build upon intermittent fasting, assuming that you're not making those mistakes with intermittent fasting already. So if you haven't checked out my intermittent fasting mistakes videos, I have one that's listed down description below that you can check out. It's 10 intermittent fasting mistakes, but I have a lot of videos that you can check out um, on my channel on intermittent fasting mistakes. Make sure you're doing that the right way because you can see a lot of great benefits with intermittent fasting. But if you're making those mistakes, you're not ever really going to see those benefits at all. Okay. Oh, Emily made it to the live. Congrats. <laughs> Happy to have you here. Okay. Um, I've lost 23 pounds so far. I'm stuck at my current weight for more than two weeks, but I want to lose more weight. Any habit change, changes I need to do? Well, first of all, definitely the three um, tips that we talked about today, the making sure you're not snacking, making sure that you're eating enough of the protein, fat and fiber, um, and making sure that you're adding in more walking and resistance training. All those done consistently can really help to break through a plateau. But again, if you are making those common intermittent fasting mistakes, you need to address those first. So this is really to see as more building upon um, your baseline with intermittent fasting and doing that properly. You need to make sure that first you're you're addressing those mistakes. Mm. Yeah, so baby carrots and hummus. So this is um, referring to snacking. So um, we talked about how removing snacking is really important to help make sure you can break through that plateau. Baby carrots and hummus, again, might seem like a healthier snack, and it's certainly a healthier snack option compared to like pretzels or popcorn. But again, there's not really any protein or fat there. There's some fiber, but not really any protein or fat. So you're not getting what your body truly needs to help achieve the body recomp. So instead, you're just getting that little insulin spike, granted not as high as if you were to have popcorn or, or chocolate or something along those lines during um, the in-between meals. But it's still not going to be fully supportive of your weight loss goals because you're not getting up the protein specifically from that snack as well. Now, one thing that is possible, so um, Sherry said, I snack on boiled egg whites, veggies with hummus or apples with nut butter. So the boiled egg whites, you do get the protein there, so that is good. Um, although you'd be better off having the full egg, so you get the protein and fat. Now it is possible, and something I do talk about with some of my clients and AM peeps is that you can do like a two meal structure with a mini meal, but that mini meal or quote snack does need to be protein optimized because that is the thing that most people are going to miss out on the most that can cause the body to not achieve the body recomp goal. So you want to make sure that if you are going to do the two meal structure with like a mini meal, that you are having it be protein optimized with a little bit of fat in there as well. So you could do like the hard boiled eggs, you could do things like the beef sticks where it has both the protein and the fat. Um, you just need to make sure that you're you're adequately um, addressing the protein. Okay, so again, if you guys have questions, but just put it in the chat for question marks before and after. It makes it easier for me to find them. Wow, so Guy Lane, I don't snack and I'm doing very well. I eat satiating meals so far. I have lost 15 pounds since beginning of November. Internet fasting, watching your videos. Wow, that's awesome. Congratulations.
Okay, Alexis, on the structured workout topic, do the workouts have to be at the same time of the day every day? No, you don't have to have it be at the same time every day. What we're looking at is just making sure that you're getting, when I talk about structure, it's making sure that you're not overworking any one muscle group. So rather than doing like total body every day or doing like leg day and then leg day right after it, you want to make sure that you have, you give some break for, um, so you aren't overtraining any one type of body part. That way you're actually getting the rest and recovery and repair uh, so that you can actually see the benefits of that workout. So if you have the 21 day intermittent fasting program, it's laid out in that way within the meal plan. So you know exactly which type of workout to follow each day. Um, but you just want to make sure you're not overworking any one body part day after day. So doing total body workouts every day is inherently going to work that, you know, every body part every single day. So that's the type of structure that we want to avoid. Okay, Katie is asking, I feel like every time I begin structured strength training using that strength from the 21 day plan, that my cortisol spikes and I begin gaining weight around the lower body. Any tips? So there's obviously a few different factors to consider. Um, you need to make sure that you're not pushing yourself too hard too fast in the beginning. So that's where I talked about Kristen's story on how, and I'll share her story soon. Um, I just got a hair in my eye. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll be sharing her story soon with what she did, but she started off with just using body weight. Um, sorry if my eye starts like watering. I, I literally just got like, I think an eyelash in my eye. <laughs> um, but she started off with just body weight so that she could allow her body to fully recover from that workout um, in between the workouts as well. Because if you're, if you're not used to using weights, that's a lot of intensity on the muscles. So you wanna start off with just your body weight. And then that way you can get that full recovery the next day from those body weight workouts. But if you're pushing yourself really hard and, and using heavier weights right away, even if those weights are like five or 10 pounds, doesn't seem like it should be excessively heavy, but if you're not used to it, and if you haven't built that strength initially, that can be quite a stressor on the body. So you need more time in between those workouts in order to help those muscles recover. So higher cortisol levels um, from workouts is typically a result of overtraining. And that symptom of overtraining will be dependent on each person. Some people need maybe three days in between workouts um, when you're first uh, building that strength in order to help to allow those muscles to recover. Then you can go down to only two days between the workouts and then have where you're able to do the um, muscle training every other day. So you just need to make sure you work with where your body's at. Start off with the just using your body weight and then build upon there and even give yourself a little bit extra um, rest time in between those workouts if you notice that you're not fully recovered, like if you're experiencing DOMS, which is that delayed onset muscle soreness, that's a big sign that you need to make sure you have more recovery um, so that you don't get that higher cortisol in between. Okay. I think that I, I think the eyelash got out of my eye, so I won't, I won't cry on camera. <laughs> so let's, Talk with Marilyn. Hello. Um, can you talk about the hormones aspect of training early in the morning to help the brain stay away from binge eating? So training early in the morning. Um, so if we're talking about fasting, we, you know, it's a common misconception that you can't, um, you can't train in a fasted state and that you need to eat right away. So let's first just debunk that because you do have the elevated growth hormone that helps to protect your muscles. Now, granted, if you do have a, um, you know, if you do have an issue with binge eating, or if you are struggling with that initially, you might want to make sure that you try and get your um, workout a little bit closer to when you go to break your fast, because for some types of workouts, it can increase your hunger. Some people have the opposite effect. Some people feel that it actually dampens their hunger. But if you notice that it increases your hunger and makes it so that it can almost start to instigate that binge eating behavior, then you'll want to make sure that you get it closer toward the end of your fast. That way you can break your fast pretty immediately to help get ahead of that hunger and really make sure that you're getting the protein and the fat to get those satiety hormones elevated. Because when those satiety hormones are elevated, we at least deal with the physical component of binge eating. There's still the emotional aspect as well that has other strategies that need to be addressed. But from the physical component, if we can at least make sure that you're not hungry, 
that is half, if not more of the battle. So if you do struggle with that, if you find that your workouts make you more hungry, then you can just try having your, um, your workout closer to when you're actually going to break your fast so that you can get ahead of that hunger and break your fast properly right away. And I know that Marilyn is having plenty of protein with her amazing meals. So you just might want to try testing out moving your workouts around closer um, to when you go to break your fast. Okay, Amelia, does heavy cream and stevia and coffee break a fast? When it comes to what breaks a fast or not, of course, there's different methods that we need to look at. So if you're using a true fast, which is a certain type of fast where you're just having water, maybe unsweetened black coffee and tea, anything other than that will break a fast. But if you're using the fasting mimicking approach, which is, and you can use both, you know, during different times of your fast, but if you are um, using that for a portion of your fast, then you just need to make sure that it's not, whatever you're eating is not going to spike your storing hormone insulin. And those food sources that do spike the storing hormone insulin are going to be protein and carbohydrates, but mostly carbohydrates. There's even some debate on if protein in, um, in isolation of carbohydrates really has any effect on insulin. But looking at heavy cream specifically, it's pretty much pure fat, but it does have some amount of carbohydrate and protein in there. And we always talk about the one gram rule, just making sure that it doesn't go over one gram of total carbohydrate or protein. So with heavy cream, it's going to be about a tablespoon. Um, I do have a lot of blog posts on my um, on my blog on do various things break a fast, like does heavy cream, does half and half, does turmeric, does ginger, does toothpaste, does gum. So I have a lot of blog posts on that. And if you guys ever are curious, like, I wonder if this breaks a fast, I probably have the answer for it on my blog. So you can just go to autumnmillnutrition.com and there's a blog section. There's a whole category on does it break a fast. So it's a really great resource that you guys can check out on there. Uh, in regards to stevia, I also, that can be a little bit of a tricky one. Technically, it wouldn't break a fast because it wouldn't raise insulin, but there are some people where it might. So you just want to see um, how your body responds. If you notice that you start to crave more sugar, if you notice that uh, you are getting hungry earlier in your fast because you're having stevia, then you might want to drop it and just use the heavy cream. But it's really dependent on the person on how they respond to these non-nutritive sweeteners. Okay. So speaking of, Emma is asking, what sweetener can we use while fasting? It just depends on how your body responds. So um, monk fruit and stevia are the two safest ones where they are non-nutritive, but they also aren't artificial. I personally prefer monk fruit. Um, I know some people like stevia as well, but I think it has a weird aftertaste. So you can experiment with seeing how your body responds with it. But if you do notice that you are still getting that um, you know, craving for sweetness, or if it's making those cravings higher, or if you're getting hungry during your fast, you might want to leave it out of your fasting period. Okay, Nicole, will pink, pink Himalayan salt give you the same benefits as Celtic sea salt? They're both great options. I just typically prefer Celtic sea salt because it's a much typically a much more affordable option. So it's great for that reason. But if you have pink Himalayan salt, you can definitely use that instead. Um, okay, so wordsmith, my snacks are low carb nuts and cheese, but is it okay to have them? So it's not even necessarily that just the type of snack is the problem. Obviously that can be a problem because a lot of snacks are going to be, you know, very insulin spiking, like I mentioned, the pretzels and the popcorn, but it's also even every time you eat, it is going to have some level of, of insulin response. And with intermittent fasting, you're eating during a much more compressed time of, you know, period of time throughout the day. So if you're eating enough of the right types of foods to support your body and its needs, you should not feel hungry enough to even need a snack. And if you do need a snack, that's actually a good sign that you do need to take a look back at your meals and adjust them to be a little bit more rich in protein and maybe even fat. So you can even use if you're craving snacks as a kind of barometer to determine do I need to change what I'm eating with my meals? Um, because remember, protein is so important for achieving a body recomposition goal. You really need to be making sure you're getting enough protein. In fact, um, my dad, who's an amazing human, he's um, a chiropractor. He's 63 years old. He has just started to recently increase. He's been using fasting as well. Um, but we've been working on him with his protein amounts to get him eating a little bit more protein to fit his needs. He's 6'2", so he needs quite a bit of protein. 
And he's noticed that he's actually seen quite a significant increase in his muscle mass when we did in-body re readings. Um, and he hasn't changed anything else. His workouts are the same and he's getting um, enough protein in now. And now he's able to actually see those body recomp goals achieved. So it isn't that necessary snacks are a problem, but it is a sign that you probably aren't getting enough of the right types of things at your previous meal, specifically protein. A lot of great questions today. Okay. Jepper, my work requires me to be on the road a lot. Is poke a good choice to break my fast? Fish itself isn't a bad choice. In fact, it's a great choice. But the problem can come in is that poke is usually going to have a lot of white rice involved too. And white rice is extremely insulin spiking. Even brown rice, extremely insulin spiking. So some people can tolerate a small amount of grains, but especially to break a fast, you go from a zero insulin spike to you want to try and level that out. You, you don't want a huge insulin spike right, right when you go to break your fast because it can make it harder to maintain that fast the next day, make you more hungry throughout the day. So I wouldn't recommend breaking your fast with a, a highly insulin spiking food, but you know, using fish is a great option. I've been thinking about doing a, um, a YouTube video coming out soon, or I haven't done it yet, but I was thinking of doing a video on different types of meals that would be great to have when you're on the go, like traveling or if you're at work and like you're at meetings. So if you guys want that, give this video a thumbs up as well and I'll do that. Okay, I'm gonna answer a couple more questions on here. Okay, y'all do. Um, I've hit a plateau. How do I figure out if my metabolism is slowed down? I'm fasting and in a calorie deficit, I just stay at 185. Should I change my routine or stay with what I'm doing? I would first, you mentioned weight. I would first have you take a look at your body fat and muscle mass. So that's going to be a much better way to determine your progress versus just weight itself because we want, I don't know how tall you are, so I don't know if 185 is close to um, what's going to be a good option for you or not. But really what will tell you um, what is going to be a good landing place for you is your body fat and muscle mass reading. So there's like cheapy type of um, scales that you can get at home. Granted, they aren't like the most accurate. I have one at my house and I just kind of use it for trends just to see how things are going. Uh, like one is called Arbo Leaf. Um, there's a couple other ones you can find on, on Amazon or at Target that are like $30. Uh, but if you have a gym that's accessible to you where they have something like an in-body or a DEXA scan where it can give you a lot more information on like muscle mass distribution, how much muscle mass you have throughout your body um, and your, your body fat percentage, that would be a better thing to help determine if you've hit a plateau because your metabolism is slowing. Uh, one way to help determine that is to get a baseline reading and then to get another reading later on. Um, like two or three weeks down the road to see if your muscle mass has decreased. Cause that's a really big indicator that you are not addressing the right area of your, um, of your eating window, because if your muscle mass is decreasing inherently, your metabolism is going to be decreasing. So by using instead of weight, but looking at your muscle mass and seeing if that's gone down by using one of these, even like the cheapy scales, which aren't highly accurate or a much better one at like a gym, like a DEXA scan or an in-body that can help to determine um, where you're at and what you need to focus on. So um, if you have hit a plateau, I would just recommend while you're getting these results, taking a look back at the three tips that we went over today and just first addressing those because that'll help you to inherently just build upon the success anyway. Um, okay, like one or two more questions. As you can hear from talking a lot, my throat will start to get a little raspy. Um, I'm on the road a lot for work. Someday I find myself fasting for 14 hours and some days my fasting hours are more than 18 hours. Is this hurting my progress? As long as within the 14 hour day versus the 18 hour day, you're able to get enough nutrients for your body's needs that shouldn't be hurting your progress. What will hurt your progress is if you address your meals the same way for 14 hours versus 18 hours. Meaning if you have enough time to have three meals during your 14 hour day, but you only have time to have two meals during your 18 hour day, but you have the same types of meals during that 18 hour day versus the 14 hour day, then you're getting a third less of your nutrient needs on that 18 hour day. So just, if you are um, able to get three full meals, which would be impressive with an 18 hour eating window, then, uh, then that shouldn't be a problem. But if you are switching back and forth from like a three meal day to a two meal day, when you have these two different types of fasting periods, then you just need to make sure that you're taking that meal that's not, that you're missing out on, and you're splitting that protein between those other two days 
or those other two meals rather. In fact, if you guys have the 21 day intermittent fasting program, I have the full protein calculation and how you can go back and forth once you have your protein amount calculated between the two meal day or three meal day. So you just know that you are getting a protein on each of those days because that's going to be the key factor for making sure that you can continue through um, with your goals of body recomp with intermittent fasting and not hitting a plateau. Okay. So I just, so someone's asking about heavy cream breaking fast. I just answered that like about five minutes ago. So if you can either rewind or you can go on to my blog. I have on autumnmelnutrition.com, um, I have a blog and there's a whole section on does it break a fast? So you can see pretty much anything that you would ever have a question on, on whether or not it breaks a fast. I've probably answered it. I have a lot of blog posts on various topics. So I have one on heavy cream. I have one on even half and half. So you can check out both of those um, for the answer. Okay, Nicole, what if I'm not hungry enough to have lunch? I know you say you don't recommend skipping meals, but what if you're not hungry? Yeah, so a couple ways that you can adjust this. You can either, if you find that just having two meals works better for you, like I mentioned, you can just make sure you keep everything else about the meals the same, except making sure that you're accounting for the proteins. So um, if you have, like I mentioned, if you have the 21 day program, make sure you go to the protein calculation day or a page and read through how it is that you can go from a three meal structure and to two meal structure and how you can split that protein um, from a three meal day into a two meal day. That way, you know, you're getting enough protein to prevent that you know, plateau and make sure you're getting enough of the amino acids that are necessary. So you also might want to play around with, I don't know how long your fasting period is, but you might want to play around with slightly opening your eating window a bit to allow for all of the at least protein that you need. You don't necessarily need to have three meals, but you do need to be making sure you're getting enough protein within your eating window. So if that means going from a 16 hour fast to a 14 hour fast in order to get that protein needs in, then that's perfectly fine. Remember, um, we talked about this, I can't remember which live stream, but like in the past three weeks, we've talked about how having a fast is really important, but also being fed is really important as well. So we want the balance of both. And because intermittent fasting is so amazing and it's really blown up and I'm, I'm so happy about that because it is such an important tool. People only focus on that though. And they forget about the fed portion. And that's where you need to be making sure you're getting the balance between these. And if you find that having a longer fast doesn't allow you to have enough of the nutrients during your eating window, then you need to help recalibrate that, rebalance it so that you can get the benefits between fasting as well as fed. Which I feel like that's a good place to end on because that is kind of like full circle, what we talked about from the beginning of this live stream. So like I mentioned, if you guys are brand new, if you're hearing this information for the first time, I cannot recommend more the complete intermittent fasting bundle. It's what the a and peeps around the world are using to help achieve their weight loss and wellness goals with the meal plans, the workouts, the ticks, the strategies. Um, the recipes to help them achieve their goals. So you can check out the link for that down description below. And if you guys haven't joined the email newsletter, make sure you do because the information taken from today was pretty much the exact same from what was from today's newsletter. So a lot of really great free information on there um, about intermittent fasting or different meals and let you know about the updates for upcoming challenges. So make sure you check that out as well. Also linked down in the description below. But other than that, this has been an amazing New Year challenge. We have one more week left, and I'm really excited to see how you guys feel by the end of this. Make sure you apply these principles that we talked about if you have hit a bit of plateau. And let's crush this last week of the challenge. Cheers to that, guys. So I'll see you. This is the last live stream for a little bit, but make sure um, we have the next live stream coming up for the next challenge, which I'll be announcing shortly as well. But just focus on this week. Focus on really crushing this last week and applying the principles we talked about and feeling good again. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in and I'll see you in my next live.